like to welcome uh, Miriam Galvin, who is going to talk to us about individual quality of life among spousal ALS patients, caregivers. Um, thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Hi, my name is Miriam Galvin. I'm from the Academic Unit of Neurology and Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. Um, and I'm going to talk today about individual quality of life in ALS patient caregiver diet. So I just want to talk a little bit about, in the context of what's going to happen in this presentation, why is the assessment of quality of life important in healthcare? Some issues around definition and measurement, and then introduce the concept of individual quality of life. And then we're going to focus on our study, which looked at the individual quality of life of ALS patients and caregivers. And we'll finish up by talking about the, the importance of assessing quality of life at an individual level. So why is the assessment of quality of life important? Well, progress in medical treatments and technology contributes to increased quantity of life. We also want to maintain and increase quality of life. Quality of life is seen as an appropriate outcome measure and desirable outcome of healthcare interventions. It is useful in health services evaluation and in healthcare delivery and facilitates person-centered care. So health-related quality of life looks at the impact of health status on life quality. Quality of life more generally looks not only at the impact of health status, but the impact of other features on quality of life. Quality of life is a subjective concept to which every individual attaches meaning, and those meanings also vary among individuals. George Kalman in the 1980s um, devised what is called what is now called the, the Kalman gap which is seen as the space between an individual's aspirations and hopes and what they experience in reality. Many quality of life measures use standardized assessments and pre-selected domains to assess quality of life of individuals. A challenge in measuring quality of life lies in its uniqueness to individuals and values and priorities change in response to life circumstances. What is seen as important changes and depends, such as in, in your progressive neurodegenerative diseases, aging, adapting to chronic illness, etc. Some examples of quality of life measures here, before we were looking at uh, the EQ5D5L, which is a descriptive system, it's, it's over five dimensions, mobility, self-care, um, activities, pain, discomfort, anxiety and depression. The patient is asked to uh, tick the box next to the most appropriate statement in each of the five dimensions. Also a vi visual analogue scale records the person's self-rated health. The McGill Quality of Life Questionnaire is a 17 item questionnaire again across five domains and people are asked to indicate how they are in their physical well-being, physical symptoms, existential well-being, and psychological support and symptoms. Individual assessments, more individualized assessments, such as the SMILE and CEQAL. So CEQAL stands for the schedule for the evaluation of individualized quality of life. Direct weighting is the version that's used here and the version we used in our, in our study, which we will talk about shortly in CEQAL. Respondents identify the areas of life which are most important to their overall quality of life. They rate the level of functioning and satisfaction with each of those areas. And then an overall index score quantifies individual quality of life. In the schedule for meaning in life, um, Martin Flegg and colleagues in Germany devised the SMILE, which itself is a respondent generated instrument for the assessment of individual of meaning in life at the individual level. So we're going to focus more now on what is individual quality of life. So as, as I've alluded to, the definition of quality of life is highly specific and individuals vary in the values they attach to different aspects of life. Quality of life is what the respondent says it is. Individualized measures increase respondents' ability to select the areas of life that are important to them, determine the relative importance of those life areas. So in our study, we looked at the individual quality of life of ALS patients and caregivers attending a clinic in Dublin, attending the National ALS Centre in Dublin. 
So as, as I mentioned, the aforementioned SQL was administered as a semi-structured interview over three interviews over approximately 18 months. So this longitudinal data collection and we had mixed methods of data analysis. And the, um, this and below here we see the um, paper that resulted from that study. So who are these people? Well, there were 28 patient care dyads, which is 56 people in all. They were actually spouses and partners of each other. And 28 spouse partners completed the CQAL interview at three time points. So we see that the majority of patients were male, the majority of caregivers was female. The site of onset, the majority site of onset was spinal onset for the patients. And over the three interviews, um, according to the MITOS, the MITOS stage, um, there was relatively normal functioning among the patients at level zero and one. So in the CQAL interview, People were asked, what are the five most important areas of your life at present? The things that you feel determine the quality of your life. They were also asked, why is that area important to you? So the important areas of life at the moment, um, the respondents were analysed, the content analysis of responses, and they, and they were coded and classified into 10 categories. And here are the categories. So the categories and the responses to what's important in life are categorised into 10 life areas. Family, friends, well-being, finance, hobbies, work, existential issues, faith, community and other. So what are some of the important areas of your life at the moment? So I'm just going to look at some of those categories and what was involved within them, what comprised the categories. So for family, um, Family consisted of when people spoke about children or husbands, marriage, grandchildren, siblings, any other family members was coded into the category of family. Similarly, health and well-being they referred to issues to do with one's own health, the respondents' own health, whether it were mental or physical health, and also the concern and importance of other people's health. Social activities, sports, travel, television, etc., were um, coded under social activities that ranged from sports through to crafts and cooking. And um, response uh, around issues such as hope, time and freedom categorised as in the existential category. So again, looking at the five most important areas in life of the patient's care dyads. So we see here that family was the mo most important overall for both patients and carers. But carers mentioned it more often than patients overall. And similarly for social activities, while it was second most important area for both, uh, it would seem to be mentioned more often by patients. Note here that health, um, while the third most frequently nominated important life area, was still quite, quite a distance behind the, the two main contenders, so to speak. It's important to note the difference between patients and caregivers in some of these. So, um, as, as mentioned, we asked, why is that area important to you? So, Patients who spoke about, say, these are some uh, selective quotations to describe why patients, with patients that described the reasons why these things were important to them. So friends were important because they felt alive being with them. Or wife was important for this man because he loves her and that's it, even though she mightn't think it. His own health is important. I, I know enough still to enjoy myself. I'm not worried about the lack of it. Fishing. It's where you can go and make your own decisions. Nobody will tell you you can't go there or here. It's exciting. Free time, I can do things at leisure. No time pressure and I have no responsibility. You have to believe in something. When you get to my age with this disease, you better. The disease doesn't bother me and religion helps me with that. For the caregivers, we ask, why is that life area important to you? So again, we look at some of the same um, categories. But for carers, friends provided respite. This person said I could talk to them, say things they wouldn't be able to say to the patient. They can give out. They don't have to protect the patient from their worries. Children are important. Um, who's going to be there for me during the illness? People she thought would have been or not there. But the children now are her support. Her, this gentleman's own health is important to him. 
because as his wife is becoming more functionally and cognitively perhaps impaired, he needs to be fit while his wife is dependent. Walking keeps me sane. A carer who goes to work, I love what I do, I've cut back and I only work three days a week. It's a bit of escapism. Finance, financial worries, um, there's not enough money to pay the bills. So we see here that the categories um, are comprised of different nuanced reasons why that category is important. And this is why this, this assessment, we believe, of individual quality of life is, is crucial. We get a sense of what matters to people and we try to work in some way to support the things that matter to them as best we can in the health environment. So those life areas for patients have changed over time. As you can see, family still remained, uh, was frequently nominated as being really, really important as was hobbies. Um, I think the social activities in general tend to be greater contributors to quality of life for patients. Um, they're common contributors. Friends and finances are important more, relatively more for carers than, than for patients. So an individual quality of life score can also be calculated um, for, for comparison purposes, if you like. And it's called the Individual um, Quality of Life, SIS, SQL Index Score. It ranges from zero to 100. So for these 56 people, 28 patients and care couples, we calculated their individual quality of life. So um, we can go into the calculation. It's, it's a specific uh, way of doing it. It's a rating area and the relative importance, um, and that's available in the literature, just to let you know. Um, so the, 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 for these patients and carers, um, we see here that the overall it was a very high, um, the median quality of life score was high for both patients and carers over time, considering it goes from zero to 100, which could be seen as um, unexpected, I guess, for, um, for people who are in such a uh, degenerative disease. Here we can see that graphically. Um, it's interesting to note that caregivers have a lower median quality of life at all interviews. So just to, just to conclude, um, we believe it's important to assess quality of life as an, on an individual basis. We've seen the level and type of information we can get from using an individualized measure. Family can be mean things, to, different things to different people and be categorized as family. And the importance of uh, an individual method is the person gets to define for themselves what's important. We believe it's important to use an individual method in conjunction with the standardized measures as relevant. Because because they're individual, it's, it's much more it's be more difficult to generalize across groups. Uh, for in clinical practice, um, uh, we believe in signposts what matters to people in the care journey and over the course of the disease. If contributors to life quality are reevaluated as patients and care partners adapt to changing circumstances. And palliative and supportive services should aim to support the factors identified to help maintain life quality as long as is practical. So I'd like to acknowledge the patients and caregivers who participated in this research, Professor Hardiman, research and clinical teams at the Academic Unit of Neurology in Trinity, Beaumont Hospital in Dublin, and the Health Research Board in Dublin, Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, for that uh, really interesting talk and discussion. Um, now, I'm just going to look and see if there are any uh, questions on the chat before I jump in. Uh, not a, not just yet, but I'm just wondering, you're suggesting that this quality of life um, assessment be done on, on patients. And then once it's done, how would you advise the professionals looking after um, the patients can utilise the scores and the results? So it's well, I not think, yeah, I think over over time. Um, it's obviously if we have identified, um, like I just as to give an example, when I was doing some of these interviews, I visited um, a patient in his home and he um, expressed to me that he had built a bird, a, a bird house in the garden. That was really important to him and it, it helped his quality of life. I went back the next time he was further impaired and he couldn't turn around and see it. But he said, I think I can hear the birds going into my house. Third time, unfortunately, his sight had gone, but he knew it was there. 
So the same thing changed over time. So if I knew that bird houses matter to that person, for example, it may seem a small, but I just gave it to you as, as an example of change over time. I mean, the, the idea of, of assessing quality of life at the individual level is it helps person-centered care because we know what matters to that person. Obviously, it's possibly quite difficult if, if you have loads and loads of patients, et cetera. But if, if you document it initially, just in terms of interpersonal, you can ask people, how is it going? You can also monitor this over time as we did in our three interviews. And I think it, it, it gives extra information to facilitate person-centered care. Oh, that's lovely. And I think um, Diane uh, would agree with you. <laughs> She's uh, in the chat is saying absolutely incredibly important thing. And the other thing I find fascinating, and I think it's just the kind of a sideline of what you were talking about, is the value and impact of friends, uh, both on the caregiver and the person living with MND and how they, they seem to change in, in their um, in their importance for people and I think yeah so I think it's really yes and for I'm hopefully doing more work on this as well apart from the top line results so what matters is for example even in the family I digress for a moment but even in family it's interesting to note that say children become quite important for, for carers as, as things continue but children are important for patients because they want some sort of legacy or they're leaving them so you know, it, it depends on the importance each person attaches. So in the context of friends, I think friends, as one of the quotations illustrated there, it gives caregivers an opportunity to perhaps leave the house, but also to offload somewhat, because in, in, in the research I was doing, quite frequently one's own family or the family of the person for whom I'm providing care are also invested in the process. So this person was afraid to speak because the mother-in-law might be upset or whatever, whereas her friend that she used to play tennis with provided an extra extra familial, if you like, outlet. Mm, yeah. So it also, it obviously also helped social interaction for the caregiver, but it also helped in terms of another person to whom they could divest. So an emotional, if you like, um, support system to an extent. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting. And um, Leslie Doyle would also uh, kind of um, agree and how important it is to highlight um, the quality of life and to be able to um, talk about that in enabling us to manage people better. Um, so lots of um, lots of positive um, feedback and agreeing with you on uh, on your feedback. So thank you for that. So thank you. Any more questions? I'll just wait one mo one more moment just to see if there's anybody awesome presentation. Somebody say, Anne. Yeah. So. Um, Yes, I don't think there are any more questions, but thank you so much. Thank you. I just leave you with the thought, if I may, Rachel. I think oftentimes people in in practice um, are so overworked and everything, and something like this can, can seem quite intense. How do I get the time to do it? So, and also for clinical trials, for example, the idea of how do we actually do this could so individualize. So that's why I believe the, the combination. So yeah. we're not saying the standard, I'm not saying certainly that the standardized measures are irrelevant or not useful. But I believe a combination of personalized and standardized just gives us more information and perhaps facilitates more, more important uh, care. So that was just to leave you with that yeah, thought. No, Thank you very much for I, this. No, that's a great point because I think I really like, I mean, lots of the research obviously is fantastic, but to have something that's practical and we can use on our daily on a daily basis, or if we can't use it, that's in our head yeah. and we can kind of implement it. As, as best we can. I think it's absolutely brilliant. So um, thank you so much for okay. that. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.